Special shout out to YouTube commenter SpikeXX for the recommendation to make this video. I am ashamed to say I had not heard of Baeza prior to his recommendation, but I am now a huge fan and think he is absolutely a rising star in the welterweight division. With Baeza's upcoming fight this weekend versus Santiago Ponzinibbio and the prior mentioned recommendation, I decided to take a deep dive on Baeza's career and analyze him from an analytics and video scouting perspective similar to my previous video on Benil Dariush. With Baeza's limited rounds, we aren't able to do as much data analytics on him, but I will make up for it with fight analysis. For this video, I'm going to take a quick dive into Baeza's stellar statistics, and then spend the rest of the video analyzing tape and making recommendations. I have timestamps for the various sections below. Miguel Baeza comes in as our number 13 active welterweight in the UFC, based on our stellar ranking system. One thing to note, Stellar does not take Dana White's Contender Series fights into account for this ranking. When comparing Baeza to the top 10 active welterweights, we can see that while he is early in his career, he is absolutely on the right track to contention. Baeza ranks just below Kamaru Usman in terms of Stellar KO score, making him middle of the pack currently. I attribute this more to his lack of fights than anything. Baeza has legit power in his hands, and this ranking will only continue to rise. Baeza ranks middle of the pack as well in stellar submission score. Based on his fighting style, I don't know how many opportunities he will see to rise in this ranking, but if he begins to mix in more grappling, his black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu will surely make this ranking go up. Baeza's stellar round winning score, PTS, is second to last, but this is more a function of his limited cage time rather than a failing on his part. My study of him projects him as an extremely effective round winner, so this ranking is surely to rise rapidly with more fights. So let's start the fight tape going in order of Baeza's career. First up is Victor Reyna. For those that watch Dana White's Contender Series, you know that Dana does not often give out contracts to winners by decision. Baeza is one of the few, and it is readily apparent why. What jumps off the screen right away is Baeza's patience. He's an incredibly patient fighter looking to make his reads and then pounce. We see Baeza stun Reyna hard with a punch somewhere between an overhand right and a cross. We see a slick back take when Reyna uses bad grappling and gives up his back. More patience from Baeza to recognize when he doesn't have the submission and gives it up to maintain his energy levels. High fight IQ decision. Reyna's weight advantage really shows in the clinch in my opinion. Reyna came in over 7 pounds overweight for this fight. I haven't seen many fights where the weight disparity showed this much aside from maybe Israel vs Jan. The second round begins with more patience and another solid cross but a high kick leads to another grappling exchange. We begin to see what will become the story of this fight. Baeza's reliance on his right hand will begin to bite him as the fight continues and Reyna begins to time it better. Baeza's speed is a real factor in this fight and in fights to come. Baeza mixes strong power with exceptional hand speed and reach advantage. Baeza's build doesn't really lend itself to power. I believe his power comes from the mixture of precision and hand speed that color his UFC career so far. We also start to see more of my most enduring criticism of Baeza, striking defense. Baeza's form, combined with his speed and dexterity, leave him open to combinations. What I mean by that is that Baeza tends to rely too heavily on his dexterity to avoid absorbing strikes while utilizing imperfect tactical defensive form. This causes problems in multiple fights including this one. Baeza tends to take flush punches at the end of combos, which will be a problem especially when he meets a fighter that can match his dexterity with their hand speed. As the round nears its end, we see Baeza drop Reyna twice, once with a knee to the head and another time with a knee to the body. With 10 more seconds in the round, Reyna would have lost by knockout. As the third round starts, we start to see Reyna turn on the gas and repeatedly land with hard punches. Reyna begins to time the crosses by Baeza with his jab, leading to a bloody nose on Baeza's part. On the broadcast, Michael talks about him falling into the clinch. This is often what you see from a lot of lower level fighters. I mean, these guys are very good, so I'm not trying to be insulting, but you know, they're still early in their careers. They have their opponent hurt, they get too excited, and they fall into the clinch. You've got to maintain that striking distance. I mean, he just landed a beautiful left, a few more of those, and he could finish the fight, but then he keeps falling into the clinch, as I said. I personally don't agree with this take, as I think this is a manifestation of Reyna's weight advantage in this fight. It is not a problem I see consistently in his later fights. Reyna really turns up the volume in the second and third, which seems to bother Baeza. That is something to monitor going forward, and is something I also noticed in his fight with Matt Brown. Baeza throws an anaconda choke on Reyna and gets reversed, 
but stays very active on his back and is able to end the fight in a triangle choke position on Reyna. For Baeza's first official UFC fight, he takes on striker Hector Aldana. The question for me going into this fight is, how does he adapt to the weaknesses he showed in his Dana White's Contender Series fight? He starts off again ripping a right hand. Leg kicks become the story of this one. Baeza's calf leg kick is fast and powerful, which is a potent combination for modern MMA. I love the step in rear leg kick. He threw it with tons of power and lands very hard. Aldana's combination would have landed hard around 130, but the speed advantage won Baeza that exchange. The first round ends with a strong takedown on Aldana. It looks like Aldana is very compromised already by the leg kicks, which opened up this takedown attempt. Aldana doesn't have an answer for his speed, and is more and more compromised by the leg kicks accentuating this problem. Trevor Whitman, who is a much smarter MMA mind than I am, highlights one of my main areas for improvement, jabbing. I'm going to reference Trevor Whitman later to identify the key jab that I think unlocks a ton of power for Baeza. Baeza ends the fight with a flurry of elbows after a leg kick knockdown. Truly exceptional display of Baeza's striking skill set. Next up, Baeza takes on UFC stalwart Matt Brown. This fight with Brown is a big test for Baeza. Brown's brawling abilities bring us back to my main concern from the Reyna fight. This is a great fight for Baeza to work on this and develop as a distance fighter. Brown keeps his hands low, which is a major mistake versus a fast fighter like Baeza. Baeza again continues to chop at Brown's legs. I love this aspect of Baeza's distance striking game. Baeza is getting whatever he wants in this fight for the first minute and a half. Then, Brown begins to get his timing down, and that's when we see Brown start to take over striking. Brown makes it into a slugging match, which doesn't fit well into Baeza's game plan. Brown stuns Baeza at the end of a combination and knocks his mouth guard out. Brown lands a couple great clinch elbows, which is his specialty. Baeza uses an interesting defense for the elbows, which I had previously not seen before. Upon watching the replay, we can see that he uses the same defense in the sequence where Brown stuns him, which I identify as a problem, and I'm going to analyze further in the discussion section. Baeza is able to land a stunning 1-2 that sits Brown down. Baeza leverages this into taking the rest of the round from Brown, making it 1-0 on my mental scorecard. Our judging model also gave this round to Baeza. Baeza takes the momentum from the end of the first into the beginning of the second. Having made his reads, he begins to up his aggression with Brown, causing him to lead the dance. Baeza lands a hard, flush counter left on Brown's chin and puts the lights out. Next up, Baeza takes on another striker in Takashi Sato. Sato comes in with a 4-inch height deficit. I would project that Baeza's distance striking will be effective at keeping Sato at distance due to this. Sato is a southpaw, which is an interesting striking test for Baeza. Baeza previously faced Reyna, a southpaw, and had a bit of a tough time lining up his strikes, as he said in his post-fight interview. Very tough to take on a, a southpaw on very late notice as well. Did his stance give you any uh, trouble in yeah. those opening rounds? Yeah, but it was my own fault again. My foot couldn't find my timing. Sato is very light on his feet and has a smart lancing jab to bridge the distance between the two. Leg kicks will be a key for Baeza to slow down Sato's movement patterns. We have previously seen karate stance southpaws like Conor McGregor show a susceptibility to calf kicks. Baeza shows the same issue I have identified throughout his career in his striking defense. This opens him up to step in uppercuts. I'm going to dive deeper into this in the discussion section. Baeza uses the stabbing front kick to the body to defend the lancing of Sato. We see Conor McGregor also use this technique throughout his career to keep his opponents at distance. It strikes me as a very effective tool in Baeza's arsenal to keep his opponents at his distance. I had previously mentioned how a fighter that can come close to matching Baeza's speed could cause him issues due to his reliance on dexterity. So far, Sato fits this bill, and we see it in Baeza's difficulty landing cleanly. This fight continues to be a jousting match between two technical distance fighters. We see that both land largely single shot combinations. Neither seem willing to step into the pocket and absorb a shot to land a couple more on their opponent. Baeza's body kicks really land hard on Sato. Baeza mixes his head and body strikes near evenly and is picking Sato apart. Baeza shoots in for a power single and transitions to the high crotch takedown, then immediately takes Sato's back. He very patiently monitors Sato's defense and then quickly locks in the tight arm triangle for his first submission in his professional career. Baeza demonstrates his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt and shows his ability to mix in striking with grappling. 
I would really like to see Baeza take advantage of the skill set more often. The threat of the takedown would really benefit him because of the way he throws his power cross slash overhand. He dips his head in a way that always looks like a takedown attempt to me, and that split second reaction time, combined with his strike speed, could lead to more clean power shots. So let's start off our discussion of Baeza with the negatives. My main concern with Baeza is his striking defense, and I will highlight two specific issues I have with it. First is how he positions his hands in certain exchanges. The best highlight of this is in the Matt Brown fight. Baeza utilizes his rear hand to guard both sides of his face by reading Brown's movement, but keeps his other hand low, which is a major mistake as demonstrated in the knockdown. Baeza uses this form sporadically in extended combinations, mixing this with his natural dexterity to try and matrix dodge his way out of danger. I think this opens him up to flash knockouts in the future unless he begins to alter this form. Fighters with more hand speed and power than Brown could have knocked the lights out in their exchange and we'd be talking about this fight entirely differently. The second concern I have is his technical high guard. Baeza leaves himself open down the middle with his technique. My mind immediately flashes to the third round of Rose Namajunas vs Jessica Andrade 2, where Andrade realized that Rose was doing the same thing and began throwing shots to get her guard up and then threw step-in power uppercuts, which broke Rose's nose, and opened up all of Andrade's offense that round. A striker with speed like Sato could really do a number on Baeza by initiating this type of strategy, and it's something Baeza will need to find a counter to. The other concern I have with respect to his striking defense plays off the earlier two points, but centers more on his dexterity advantage. Baeza shows strong dexterity and strike avoidance, which when combined with his height and reach make him a hard target to land cleanly on. While this has its obvious positives, it also covers up the above two mistakes. I would like to highlight Tony Ferguson's last three fights as an example of this. Tony used his natural athleticism advantage and toughness to eat shots and to defend in a technically poor way, but his athleticism masked this issue early in his career. When he aged and his athleticism faded, he wasn't able to make up for it with technical superiority, leading to him taking a lot of damage and falling off as a fighter. Baeza has the time now to make these adjustments and avoid the same fate as Ferguson and also Silva's later career. If he is able to develop a more technical striking defensive posture, his natural dexterity will only serve to hypercharge the skill set, increasing his career longevity, reducing his knockout likelihood, and rocketing him to contention. Now onto the positives. I believe that by rectifying the defensive issues, Baez is a top 5 welterweight at present, but I don't see him being able to beat the top 4 in the division. To accomplish this, he needs to unlock more of his natural talent through the development of a specific aspect of a single skill, the jab. While it is easy to say, add a jab, and pat myself on the back as the genius analyst, I think that we can take it a step further and identify a single jab type to really hone in on the recommendation. The specific jab I like is the base jab, which I would recommend he master, and comes from a fantastic video by Trevor Whitman. I have linked to the full video here, but I'm going to show a clip from it where he explains the base jab. The base jab. Many people call it the body jab. And I call it the base jab, yes, because it puts you on your base. But you can also use it to the head. So if I'm dropping down and changing levels, they're dropping with me. So we're dropping that base. But I can drop and come back up to the head. It is a base jab. If you hit them in the center, in the body, you put them on their heels. If someone has good footwork and they're moving away from you and they're always getting, you're like, hey man, get back over here, get back over here. When you level change and hit to the body, they have to base, they have, to, you have to clinch your body to take a body shot. And it's a jab, it's a long shot. So again, those, those, those opponents who you're chasing around, you're trying to get to, try the body jab. It's key, the base jab. If Baeza has the time, I would recommend all of the jabs he mentions. But to me, the base jab complements Baeza's already stellar striking arsenal, but has the added benefit of opening up his power options. As an aside, here's another video with Trevor Whitman and Dwayne Ludwig that I found after writing the script for this video. I believe this technique would also be a fantastic complement to Baeza's current skill set. I have linked to the full video above as well. All right, so when, when someone's throwing a jab at you, it's the number one punch thrown in MMA. When they're throwing it, don't just try to counter it right away because people cannot beat the jab. Understand the jab first. So the first thing you want to do is when he's throwing a jab, is understand the range, understand the play with it. Like you have to be able to defend it first before you can shut it down. Now, once I understand the timing, what I'm going to go for is the body, not the head. Okay, so as he throws, I'm driving a power shot under and I'm making it look like an overhand. Like I'm dropping my head outside the right hand and I'm finding the pocket between the lat and the pec. The soft spot, just above the obliques. Okay, so when he throws a jab, I drop and I throw a power shot. 
Okay, so next time he's throwing a jab, he's like, oh, every time I wanted to get it back. So the next time he throws a jab, I look low and I come with the power shot. Know how to set up your power. But back to the base jab. Trevor talks about how the base jab causes the opponent to tense up, and after landing a few of these, they will begin to drop their hands. Baez's exceptional hand speed will allow him to combo this jab with his power right to catch his opponents with their guard down. Once Baez has landed a couple times and gets his opponent thinking, he can fake it and start throwing single power rights or high kicks. This will serve the dual purpose of landing hard while also confusing the opponent. His opponents won't know where he's going for, opening up his entire power arsenal. Along these same lines, I would like to see Baeza mix in more power single legs like he used in the fight with Sato. He can leverage his black belt while grappling, but it also serves the purpose the base jab does, where opposing fighters begin to drop their hands to defend a takedown. If Baeza combines the base jab and increased takedown attempts, he will essentially be able to land where he wants, when he wants, after establishing his tools. This will lead him to either knocking out his opponent or consistently winning on scorecards. By implementing the above four recommendations, I see Baeza as a top five contender in the welterweight division. He could cause serious problems for many of the top contenders. Before we go, let's talk about his fight this weekend versus Santiago Ponzinibbio. Santiago came off a long layoff due to an injury and was knocked out by Li Jiang Liang. Li caught Santiago with a looping hook that landed cleanly for the knockout. Because of Santiago's long layoff, it is difficult to analyze what he looks like as a fighter at this stage of his career, but I will use the Lee fight as my baseline. Baez's speed and strike avoidance could cause a lot of problems for Santiago. As the broadcast said in his previous fight, Santiago throws technical, straight punches, so fighters who effectively leave the center line will cause him issues. Baez has this skill in spades, and he has shown effective counters off of his evasions. I would not be surprised to see a similar end to this fight compared to the Lee fight. The other thing I noticed is how hard Santiago is on his lead foot. Baeza will pick that leg apart, compromising Santiago's movement and furthering the disparity in the speed department between the two fighters. I'm not sure how much Santiago's chin will hold up, but if it does, I see Baeza winning this fight in a decision, and I believe a knockout is a very likely outcome as well. So where does Baeza go from there? With a victory, I think he should match up with number 10 UFC ranked and number 15 stellar ranked Jeff Neal. Neil has a lot of power in his hands and would be a great striking test for Baeza to further develop his striking defense. With a loss, I believe he should fight unranked by UFC but number 5 stellar ranked James Kraus. Kraus mixes his martial arts very effectively and is very underrated in the opinion of our model. This would be a fantastic test for Baeza's full skill set and will help his ranking in the eyes of our model. Baeza consistently fights strikers, which limits his ceiling in my eyes. For him to be able to compete with balanced grapplers like Kamaru Usman, Colby Covington, and Gilbert Burns, he needs to be tested by more balanced fighters like Kraus so he can learn from his mistakes in lower stakes environments. If you like this content, I previously released a video on Benil Dariush that you can check out, and next week we will be releasing our breakdown of the Israel Adesanya vs Marvin Vittori fight centered on Vittori's career from a data and scouting perspective. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel.